All right, here in the first part of the first module, we're going to look at terms and topologies. So there'll be some terms that you see throughout that'll be relatively common. Uh, we need to you know, be aware of their definitions or understand their definitions. Those are asset, vulnerability, threat, mitigation, and risk. An asset's what it is you're trying to protect. And that can be tangible and intangible. It can be a physical thing uh, that you're trying to protect people, a device, uh, or it can be intangible, such as data, trade secrets, uh, things like that. So an asset's whatever it is you're trying to protect. A vulnerability is a weakness or a flaw somewhere in your network. Uh, and vulnerabilities by a lot of vendors uh, and third-party sources or, you know, open are oftentimes, there's a database of them. A lot of vendors keep a database of vulnerabilities. Um, different organizations keep databases of vulnerabilities so that you can try to keep on top of or know which areas your network will be vulnerable in. Uh, in. For example, Cisco has a list or a database of various vulnerabilities, and we'll just pull that up real quick. So here's a list of current vulnerabilities. I mean, you could go through and you can view a lot more obviously, and there's a ton of them that keep happening. So the first one we look at is it looks like uh, we have multiple vulnerabilities in network time protocol daemon affecting Cisco products. So there's something in NTP, there's some weakness in NTP that does affect Cisco products. And we can go ahead and click on that. I mean, here's just a quick summary of it if you just like let, put your mouse over it. But if we go ahead and click on it, it'll bring up and it's going to tell us a little more about it. It's going to tell us it's CV. It's going to tell us when it was first published and when it was last updated. Are there any workarounds available right now? What's Cisco going to do about it, I guess, in a sense? And not just them, but everyone's going to have some sort of an issue here and what it is. So here's the summary. Multiple Cisco products incorporate a version of NTP or Network Time Protocol package. Versions of this package are affected by one or more vulnerabilities that can allow, allow an unauthenticated remote attacker to cause a denial of service condition or modify the time and so on. Uh, then they'll list the vulnerabilities, additional details, and then I said, what's Cisco, even though it came out. Cisco will release software updates that address these vulnerabilities, right? So when we talk about, well, I'll come back to it. Let me come back to it. So that's a vulnerability. There's a weakness somewhere in NTP, and actually it says what they are. The summary tells us what it can cause, the denial of service attack, right? So let's, let's keep going with that. Since we found the vulnerability, let's, let's keep going with that and use that to help us define the terms. So the next term is threat. Threat's an attempt to compromise the network or, I mean, and or the asset. So a threat is the potential that that vulnerability will turn into attack that causes us a problem, right? That compromises something. So our vulnerability, if we go with the NTP, is NTP. And one of the things mentioned in the summary is that this vulnerability uh, is vulnerable, for example, to a denial of service attack. So my threat is that someone will um, use that, that NTP vulnerability to complete a DOS attack on my network. Maybe, you know, to take down my network, maybe it's an e-commerce site, uh, whatever it is, and thereby then now uh, compromise our network or our asset in this case. So our assets, what we're trying to protect, our vulnerability is that weakness or that flaw in my network uh, in our example that we looked up, uh, it was an issue with NTP. My threat is the potential that that vulnerability, and in this case, that weakness or that flaw in NTP, is actually going to be compromised, right? And then mitigation is what we're going to do to reduce the vulnerability. So when we look back at that listed vulnerability, what, what Cisco's going to do in this case, in, in this example, is they'll release a software update to address it. So an attempt to mitigate that vulnerability or reduce um, the severity of it, they're going to go ahead and release an update, which you have to, of course, download or patch or, or whatever that result is. So that's our mitigation. And then risk is the probability of uh, the threat being successful and any of the consequences. So we talk about things like risk analysis. And so when we decide when we want to protect a network, 
how many resources we're going to put or money or people or whatever towards protecting those assets. Uh, we do a risk analysis and that could be quantitative or qualitative. And part of that is to say, okay, what's the likelihood uh, that this th that the threat will be successful? So what's what's the likelihood that someone can complete a DOS attack on my network? And then what are the consequences of that event occurring? Okay. So those are some of our terms. Let's look at what our topologies are. The first one, and I know it's not listed in your curriculum, I just think they use the term so we should look at it, uh, is local area network, which basically just connects computers and devices within the same building or within you know, close buildings, adjacent buildings. Everything's really close and near each other, uh, hence the term local, right? We have the campus area network that will interconnect LANs within the same area, uh, and it generally provides connectivity for servers, computers, phones, things like that and services to the users within the organization. Uh, so a campus area network could span multiple buildings, but we're not necessarily going over a large geographical area in any means. Uh, and, and generally it's your organization, uh, your headquarters. Um, and then a wide area network is going to span a large geographical area, oftentimes using a public network such as the internet. And we'll look at other, we'll look at technologies to secure our network when we go over a wide area network. So we have a local area network, which is all exactly what it says local. We're going to connect our computer and devices uh, within, within mostly the same building or even adjacent buildings. Our campus area network interconnects LANs, there's an interconnected series of LANs within the same area and provides connectivity and services to users within your organization. Small office, home office is exactly what it says. Uh, you're looking at someone working from home, you know, a small office or home office generally, you know, uses consumer grade router maybe, or even an integrated wireless router uh, to connect in, or a small ASA, like a, like a 5505 or something, um, to gain access uh, to usually a public network, to usually the internet, and then connecting back into your headquarters or maybe a branch office or something like that. And then we have the data center network, which connects all the data center resources. So our data centers are generally servers and storage and voice and, and unified communication systems. You know, that, that's our data center. Our data center network is what connects all of those resources together. And when we look at a data center network, we look at securing you know, two things, the outside perimeter and the inside perimeter. So the outside perimeter are, you know, in order to secure it, we could have fences and gates and you know people talk about things like alarms and video surveillance and officers outside. And then to secure the inside perimeter, uh, then we would still consider, you know, continue with our video, in motion detectors, uh, security traps, um, multiple ways of authenticating such as biometrics to get access. Um, ways of paying attention to who's coming in and out of the data center. And a security trap is like, is like a hallway where you would first come into the first door. So it's like a hallway to gain access to the data center. You would come in, you know, use your fingerprint or whatever, and, and come in or swipe card or whatever, whatever it is you're required to do. You come into the first door and you're kind of in the secure area where there's no data center. And then you have a second door uh, to get into to actually get into the data center. So it's like a hallway in there. Then we have our cloud or virtual network, which is an offsite systems and resources that can be provisioned on demand. So clouds, cloud uh, infrastructure or software or platforms, things like that. Part of being the cloud is that we can provision on, on demand, right? That we can, we don't have to build up big systems and stuff. You know, suddenly we, our company uh, maybe merged with someone else and we've got all these needs, maybe we have massive server needs or something or data storage needs or something and we can uh, provision them over the cloud on demand. And that comes with, uh, we'll hit some of this, uh, the cloud stuff like in a highlight, um, but that comes with a whole other set of security interests or things to pay attention to. For the most part, this course looks uh, at the campus area network. That's, that's the main area we're going to focus on here.
we will look at a couple things. We'll look at virtual machine threats. So virtualization and cloud aren't the same thing, but in order for the cloud to kind of do what it does the way it does it, you pretty much need virtualization. I mean, I guess not by definition 100% requirement, but you pretty much do. So as we run our virtual machines, there are three things that we want to pay attention to, are three virtual machine threats. There are others. These are some of the main ones listed. Hyperjacking is when an attacker hijacks the hypervisor in an effort to use that to gain access to other areas. It could be other virtual machines even. And that's one of the things that uh, why the data center and, and the cloud and virtual machines come with a different set of maybe networking requirements. We need virtual networking because a lot of what happens uh, inside may never leave the physical servers themselves. So a lot of the data that traverses and whatnot may not ever leave that physical storage um, area. So then we need things like virtual routers and virtual switches uh, and the virtual ASA. So anyway, hyperjacking is hijacking the hypervisor in order to you know, usually gain access to something else or to compromise something else. Instant on activation refers to outdated security on a virtual machine. So if you have virtual machines powered down for a long time, as we saw just in that list of vulnerabilities, just in the things you know, for Cisco devices, not even necessarily uh, server software and whatnot, there were all kinds of vulnerabilities listed. And, and there will probably you know, be ones, new ones every day so when you have virtual machines shut down for a long time, a lot of things have changed within your security policies. Uh, updates need A lot of updates need to be done, things like that. So when you fire on those virtual machines for the first time, their security will likely be outdated. And so that's what instant on activation refers to. And the antivirus storm with VMs is when all the VMs try to download antivirus files at once. So they all go through. They're trying to update their files, you know, much like you probably specified in your policy that there will be antivirus on them and they will periodically or automatically update. Uh, that an antivirus storm will happen when all your VMs try to do it at the same time or when a massive number of them try to download that data file at the same time. Next, we'll look at the secure data center solution. The secure data center solution really just has three parts. So the components of the secure data solution are secure segmentation, threat defense, and visibility. Secure segmentation just means we're going to use ASAs and virtual security gateways installed in the Nexus series devices uh, to provide secure segmentation within that data center. Okay. Threat defense, we'll use IPS and ASAs. Uh, we use the device IPS, IPS and ASA devices that use threat intelligence, uh, reputation, and contextual analysis to provide threat defense. So it's going to gather a bunch of information. And there are a whole bunch of terms and a whole class we could go over just on this. Um, but know that, you know, and, and, and things like OS fingerprinting, so that third part, it's going to provide threat defense, but it's going to do it by uh, intelligence, analysis, fingerprinting. Uh, through multiple different databases and things also that they know about and signatures that they know about and all kinds of other good things. And last component is visibility, which can be provided through software like the Cisco Security Manager, and there's other stuff, uh, but that's one in particular that we looked at, that we will look at. Um, it provides secure management, keeps track of policies and objects and events and all kinds of things to provide visibility. And our last section here, I said it was going to be quick. I'm going to try to make sure I keep them all a reasonable amount of time, try to keep your attention for a little bit, especially when we're not configuring stuff yet. Uh, we're going to look at attack vectors and data loss vectors. An attack vector is simply the path that an attacker takes to gain access to the networks, computers, servers. Right? What's the path that our attacker takes in an attempt to compromise our asset. Two major ones that we look at are external, so the attack is coming from the outside of the network, such as the internet, uh, or internal, where it's coming from the inside of the network, such as your internal user. An internal threat can be much more costly uh, than an external threat, because if you think about it, your internal users, 
already have a certain amount of access to your network. Right? They're already given some access depending on the kind of user they are. And they can really compromise things intentionally if they want uh, or accidentally. You know, bringing a USB drive from home, plugging it in. If we don't have it, so either we don't let them plug things into the USB or we automatically scan anything that gets plugged in, they could easily bring uh, a virus into our network or, or malware or something like that, install it, and it could compromise all the computers on our network. Uh, so it could be accidental. In fact, I had, uh, I worked with a gentleman years and years and years ago who, this is a little funny, he was actually back in one of the smaller parts of our data center, one of the smaller data centers, and he decided he was going to vacuum. And so he'd unplugged the cable real quick, plugged in the vacuum, started vacuuming. Unbeknownst to him, or he didn't follow the cable to realize that the cable that he plugged in was a major core, or unplugged, sorry, was a major core switch. So he had taken down a portion of the backbone of the entire network just to vacuum. Completely accidental. But because he had access to our network, uh, physical access, uh, and trust, you know, there was there was a cost there to having that backbone down, or you know, having that portion of the backbone down. So, it doesn't necessarily have to be intentional, but unfortunately, they can be more costly uh, because intentional or not, they have access to a lot of things in your network already, you know, physical uh, access and passwords and things like that. Uh, so, threats come from both parts, and you have to pay attention and monitor both sides of your network. And lastly, we look at data loss vectors. So vectors of data loss you know, are places where data can be lost. We look at email or webmail. You know, if you had an intercepted email, it could contain confidential information or unencrypted devices. So if you have a tablet, um, you know, so for example, even you, you, know, you have your workers, they all have tablets or they have laptops or whatever, and that's what they work on all the time, and they store their data. If that device gets stolen and that data is unencrypted, uh, that can all reveal confidential information, whatever was stored on that tablet. Cloud storage, data can be lost if cloud storage is compromised. So if for some reason uh, your storage in the cloud is compromised, you can lose that data. And I already kind of gave an example earlier of removable media, but a lost USB drive um, that may have confidential data on it. Maybe, maybe an employee was going to uh, work on something at home, so they saved all the files and went to bring it home and lost it along the way. If someone gets a hold of that, and that's not encrypted. Um, obviously, that can be dangerous. And hard copy, confidential reports or data need to be shredded when you're done with them. So you've got your virtual copies, and we can delete them and things like that. We can encrypt, I encrypt them and delete them. Uh, hard copies, when you're done with them, they need to be shredded. And then lastly, improper access control. So stolen or weak passwords, we're going to make it easier for an attack attacker. So you need to train yourself and your uh, users or employees to uh, have strong passwords. Don't leave their passwords on their monitors or places that are relatively easy for other people to see. When you're entering them, don't let someone sit over your shoulder. It's, it's all those kinds of things so people that get access uh, because we didn't do things correctly. Uh, so that, that's really it. That's the end of the first part of the first section, our uh, vectors of vectors of data loss was the end of our terms and our topologies. If you have any questions, let me know.